welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. And on this episode, episode 182, we are speaking with none other than Les George. Uh, Les was a guest number 17 on episode number 17 here. That was a long time ago, and uh, it was a phone interview. And now we get to we get to share some time with Les uh, on screen and, and catch up with him and find out what's up with him. Uh, he is a preeminent uh, modern knife maker, custom knife maker, and designer with... Uh, collaborations in the production world with ZT, uh, Spartan Blades, ProTech, Kershaw, uh, Florian Knives, a lot more. And uh, he also has a, a thriving uh, custom uh, line of knives. And uh, lately, the past couple of years, really turning my head with his gorgeous daggers uh, represented in production right now uh, at Spartan Blades, but also his uh, hand cast knuckle duster what is it? 1918 style trench knives, uh, trench daggers, which are just outstandingly gorgeous. Uh, in any case, uh, that's what brings Les uh, to, uh, to our show this week. Before we get there, if you think this is a valuable show, you like what we do, uh, go check us out on Patreon. There are some uh, uh, great things you can you can get out of becoming a member there. Uh, chief among them, a monthly knife giveaway. So definitely check out Patreon. And that is it. Uh, that's it for me, hawking my wares. Uh, so without delay, I bring you Les George. Got a question or comment? Call the Knife Junkies listener line at 724-466-4487. So, Les, <laughs> welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. I'm doing good. How are y'all? Oh, doing great. It's great to see you again. Well, actually, to see you for the first time, it's great to hear you again, Right. I guess I should say. Um, uh, I want to find out a little bit about what led to your becoming the knife maker I just described. You are one of my my absolute uh, favorite knife makers and designers. So if for a moment I sound starstruck, uh, please forgive me. But uh, what I was carrying <laughs> today was one of my prized uh, collection knives. I'm going to put it under the knife cam here. It's my uh, it's my VSEP or V E C. Nice. Um, I'm not sure how. What what do you call it? VSEP. VSEP. Okay. Well, old right. one. Is this an old? Yeah, yeah. I think this is a, and this I know is not the clip that originally came on this one. This is a a, a later generation clip. Uh, right. The gentleman that I bought this from said that he he got the clip from you. I guess mm -hmm. replacing the spoon clip. Mm -hmm. uh, but this has long been one of my absolute uh, favorite designs, and uh, for a long time it was out of reach until ProTech came out with the Rock Eye, and I got this. And the day I got it, I emailed you. Uh, I emailed you and uh, said, Les, I love this knife. Uh, and, and you got back to me right away, said, thanks. They did a great job on it. In any case, thanks for coming on the show. I had to show off my, my Les George knives right there. Uh, the knife awesome. cam is coming online now, and I'll show them off later too. Uh, there we go. Uh, oh, and I also have I got this from my brother-in-law for Christmas a couple of years ago, uh, the Weston. Great little knife, kind of an unsung knife, but I love the design. Um, in any case, Les, I know that uh, you were in the Marine Corps. Thank you for your service, sir. And uh, oh, you're, you're not hearing me? Now, now I'm good. Now I'm good. When the knife okay. came come up, I couldn't see nothing. I couldn't hear nothing. Okay. Uh, so I want to uh, thank you for your service, first of all, and tell us uh, what you did in the Marine Corps uh, that uh, inspired your your career in knives? I was in the Marines for just over 10 years. And during the time I was, uh, I started out as a heavy equipment mechanic. Then I became an embassy guard. I guarded two different embassies. And then I went into a uh, explosive ordnance disposal and making the bad bomb stop in the Marines. So. What is that like? EOD? Which one? Uh, uh, EOD? Or, yeah, yeah. That's the one everyone wants to talk about all the time. Um, <laughs> you're either you're either 100% right or 100% wrong in everything you do. So well, okay. So yeah, that's that's putting a uh, that's putting a, a a blunt head on it, but I mean, that's got to be a super stressful job. Of all those things you mentioned, I'm sure embassy guard is ha, is not without its stress. Uh, boring. But, 
Oh, is it boring until someone starts storming the gates and then you got to get. <laughs> but well, EOD, t- tell me what that's actually like. So every every uh, EOD incident ends the same way. It ends in an explosion every time without exception. So well, that's how all explosives are dealt with. You can burn them or you can split hairs about whether that's blowing up or not, but you're going to dispose of by fire of some velocity, all explosive items at some point in their life. That's the only way to get rid of it really. And you can split hairs on that too. But um, so basically that's how we're going to do it. Sometimes you can just roll up, see where it is and you can blow it up right there. High five. We're going home. We're all winners. Sometimes you got to take it somewhere else to, to blow it up because you can't blow it up underneath the Colonel's car or, or wherever it is. So you'll, so you sometimes, and then sometimes you can just pick it up and move it somewhere else to, at your will, and and put it there and blow it up there because you know whatever it is. Sometimes you have to make it safe to move to that other place, and that's the the proverbial diffusing of bombs is making it safe to move somewhere else to blow it up somewhere else where we decide for it to go and get exploded. Uh, this is going to sound like an extremely naive question from your perspective, but uh, the the way it's depicted in movies with the red wire and the blue wire, no, 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 not that one. Uh, how much of that is real? It's always the red wire. Always. <laughs> okay, good. Good to know. Good to know. So I'm assuming every single thing is different. Everything is different. You just look at it. Uh, I've I've done a lot of IEDs. There's a lot of guys who were in when I was you know when I was doing it did. But I, and I never saw a device that I looked at and I had to go, oh, no, they got me. It's I don't know what to do now because it's just too clever. It's, it was, so that was, was yeah. that was in Iraq. Yeah. OK, that was in Iraq. So so not not incredibly sophisticated, but incredibly deadly. And you got to walk up on these things and take care of it. And I would imagine that it, uh, it gets you to cultivate some nerve, some some real nerve. Well, between that and my rugged good looks and boyish charm, there's nothing I can't do. My mom said so. <laughs> I love it. So um, I have seen pictures of what I, I'm not sure if it's your first knife or not, but it was a uh, uh, a, a really stout tanto, and I think you described it as as something that you made for yourself to kind of excuse the term, but poke around in the sand with. Uh, no, you you've definitely not seen my first knife because that has never yeah. been photographed, nor shall it be. Okay. It's, hor- it's horrible. And I was 12. But uh, the knife you're talking about was the first of the EOD kind of knives that I made. And I did make it. I made it in Iraq just because I thought I should. I mean, but yeah, we used it. We use it for all the things that you're not supposed to use knives for prying and digging and all the other stuff. So it, I had another knife for actual knife business knife cutting and tape and whatnot. So, oh, do you have it on the wall over there? No, I thought I had one of the issued EOD knives hanging on the wall, but I don't. Oh. So, uh, what is the pro- what did that look like making a knife on deployment, uh, presumably on base in Iraq? Well, I just I took an ammo crate and I drilled some holes in a piece of steel that a friend of mine, Gary Bradburn, sent me, and I just went to town with a file. Wow. Okay. So, so it was hardened, and you just kind of no, I, I heat treated it there treated after it. I filed it. Okay, so safe to say you've come a long way, baby. Yeah, I've come a long way from an ammo crate in the Alambar province. Okay, so so you get back to the states in um, what was it, 2010? 20? No, that was I, I was in Iraq in 06 and 07. Okay, so whenever you come back stateside, you start making knives, or you decide to make knives. How how does that become a thing that you do for a living? Well, I I've been, I started making knives when I was 12, and I made knives all through high school. And then when I actually enlisted and went into the Marines, I, I kind of put it down because I traveled a lot, and it did, that is kind of the kind of thing that travels real well. Right. So I didn't do that for a while. Then I got to Hawaii in 04. I enlisted in 97, got to Hawaii in 04. And turns out I lived like two, three miles away from Stan Fujisaka, the, the great master of Hawaii who taught Ken Onion and all kind of other people. And and he invited me over to his shop. Well, he didn't really invite me. He told me to report to his shop one day. So I, I, I rolled over there and he looked me up and down. And I figured it was a social visit. He looked me up and down. And he goes, yeah, you're wearing grinding clothes. Good enough. Sit down and start grinding. 
So that's how I, I learned how to do folders and hollow grinding was from staying there. So that was an 04. And then I, I, so I went over there to his shop pretty much every Saturday I was on the Island. So about, about half the time when I was on the Island, I was over there. Uh, and then I went to Iraq and did my little bit that, that one knife in Iraq. And I came back and kept working on folders with Stan. And then I, uh, I got out of the Marines in 08 and I went and did a one civilian job as a UXO technician. And that's, that's a horrible job. I don't wish what's, on anybody. What's, what's UXO? UXO is unexploded ordnance. Oh. So it's kind of doing the same kind of thing, except it's all on ordnance and impact areas. Because all these, all these places where they shoot mortars and artillery rounds in America, eventually they're going to get turned into housing developments and they contract the government. <laughs> I'm serious. I believe the government, it. the government contracts these UXO unexploded ordnance companies to go in and remove all metal bigger than one inch by one inch square down to three feet depth. Wow. And, and supposedly that gets all the, all the scary things out, but it I'm telling you it doesn't either. But, uh, I did one, I did six weeks of that in Anniston, Alabama. I guess it's Fort McCullough there. Mm-hmm. And it sucked bad. I'm like, this is, this is horrible. I don't want to do this. So, wait, wait. I, does it suck because it's trudgery, or does it suck because you could just step on a mine that everyone forgot was there? No, there was nothing dangerous about it. You weren't. Oh. I wasn't allowed to touch anything. All of a sudden, you know, I went from being a team leader in Iraq and a, you know, and a senior explosive ordnance disposal in the Marine Corps to don't touch it. That's scary. <laughs> like my first day there, I picked up a mortar and I'm like, "Hey, where are we going to put these things?" And then everybody freaked out, and I almost got fired. <laughs> I'm like, it's a mortar, you girls. <laughs> well, it's, okay. it's just the rules there, and I didn't. I don't like jobs. Yeah, who does? No, I know, right? <laughs> so wait, I want to go back. So, so uh, you're in Hawaii. You're learning um, uh, in the Fuji Saka studio uh, yeah. or or shop. You go away, and then you come mm-hmm. back. You mm-hmm. go to Iraq, and you come back. Mm-hmm. what's it like i mean uh did you lose most of your chops or, or or were you able to come back into his shop and kind of pick up where you left off I, I mean you know you practice something for a while and then you have to give it up for two years when you come back to it how was that like i was did, only gone seven months seven months okay but uh i don't i never really thought about that question i don't recall any any huge getting back on the horse learning curve I find in my own life when I'm at the pitch of something like really trying to learn something hard or new or difficult, uh, if if I take if I take time off, it's like my my mind is fine, but everything else goes. Like if it's a physical skill, it's a, it's almost like I have to relearn it. But when I come back to it, my head's a little better about it. it. It can be like that, and I don't remember if I screwed a bunch of knives up when I first got back or not. I might have. I think that was around the time when Stan started talking about hitting me. <laughs> <laughs> he used to say stuff like he'd look at what I was doing and go, you know, if we, if you were apprenticing in Japan, I'd be smacking you in the back of the head right now. <laughs> and I stop and look at him and be like, Stan, do you, do you want to hit me? And he would just leave. Man. He'd never answer the question. <laughs> so he taught you hollow grinding and how to make a folder. Uh, mm-hmm. was, is that a, a locking, uh, lining, uh, yeah. liner lock or frame lock folder? Yeah. He made knives in a, in a real gentlemanly liner lock style with bolsters. And like, I've got that knife over in the toolbox. I can get it if you want, but it's a, it was a drop point knife with a, a, a liner lock with bolsters. And I think I put mammoth ivory on the scales and it had a titanium oh, yeah. bolsters. And I think that's on your website. I think I've seen that in your, on your, in your past work stuff. Yeah. I, I do want to see that, but first I want to see, and, and I'm jumping ahead because you picked it up and waved it around, pretended it was a mortar. But let's let's see this. I mean, this this is the bell of the ball, if you ask me, right here. Okay, so this is the one I picked up as an original from 1918. It's a LFNC. Wow. So that's original. So this is the original that I based my handle off of. So I took this handle off and I sent it out to get 3D scanned. And they 3D scanned it, including every little flaw and defect that these knives have in them, just because it was 100 years ago. Yeah. And then I got that file, and I, a friend of mine works in a friend of mine, a friend of a friend works in special effects in the movies. 
So he took that file and he fixed it. He fixed all the casting flaws and all the tool marks and dents and dings for the last hundred years and basically gave me a perfect example of what they meant to do in 1918. And that's the, the model that we cast the titanium handles on. Wow. So this knife is cast grade five titanium with a CPM uh, 3V blade. This is minus hollow ground. The original is flat ground. Okay. And I have a, and my, my, my uh, skull crusher is D2. He treated D2. And then my sheath is 3D machine G10. The original is uh, stamp sheet metal. Wow. And then. That is fucking amazing. Excuse my French. Yeah, buddy. And then the, uh, the current version is this is the prototype for that. It's a CPM 3V blade, Cerakote black. And uh, cast brass with what they called the, the airborne mod. So What's it'll that? act. So that's where they removed. The, oh yes. So the the problem with this knife is that it's held to carry because you can't really put it into a sheath. You can't really carry it on your body because that guard is in the way of all the the carrying methods you can think of. Right. So it's really cool, but when you take the the guard away like that. Now you don't lose much in the way of, of protection or utility, but now it's actually it can fit into a leather sheath, and it can be carried in a, in a pretty civilized manner now. Yeah, wow, that is a that is every civilized man and woman should have that tool. Uh, that is beautiful in in that leather sheath. It uh, that's that's amazing. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Les, can you the one that you put in the leather sheath? Can you pull that back out for a second? I want to ask you something. Um, Man. So, uh, how did you get? So, you said that that is cast brass. Yeah. How did you get it black? What's on there? I'm it's it's Cerakote. Cerakote. Okay. The original that that's the prototype one, and it's. I'm gonna pull this thing off. It's uh, Cerakoted. The uh, that's one of them in the raw. Okay. And that's how I'm doing the all of them now, really, except for a couple here and there. This one hasn't even been lasered yet. But uh, that's so, how many how many of these are you doing? This is I'm I'm assuming this is an extremely limited run, and they're probably already spoken for. And I'm not angling, but I'm just curious, like how, what this project is, like what you're aiming to do with this project. Well, the the titanium ones I did ten for the centennial for the for the 2018 I did ten. And I kept the one because I had to. Yeah. The uh, the brass is an ongoing project. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm getting ready to. I'm actually machining handles all day today and for the last week or so. Um. So that's a pro. That's something that I'm working on now for another release. Um. I don't know how many there are exactly. I don't keep track of things like that. But there's a lot more brass ones than there were because I had a a mold made to cast brass ones. Whereas the the titanium ones were investment casts from 3D printed wax models. Oh, oh, so that means the the mold is destroyed each time. And okay, mm -hmm. um, so we're talking about an extremely limited uh, run of these of these 1918 trench knives uh, through your vision, uh, and and that's kind of totally opposite of something else. I think of you. Four, which is the concept of mid tech. And last time we spoke, you said you didn't invent it, but for me, like uh, you are the person who uh, um, that brought it kind of to the forefront. The fact that that uh, people are making, you know, custom knife knives <laughs> can do this process where they have some of the of the grunt work, if you will, uh, done out of house, and then and then do all the finishing in house. So you get a certain quality. But without uh, without being slowed down by by certain factors, and of course, there's a you you it you pay a premium for something that is completely made soup to nuts by you, hand ground blade, etc. But tell me about mid the mid tech concept and how it's worked into your career, and what you consider mid tech and what you consider custom. So basically, for me, the only difference between a custom and a mid tech is the hand grinding of blades. So if it's, a, if it's a handmade or a custom, I use those two words pretty interchangeably, even though we probably shouldn't. But I do, and most people do. 
So the custom knife is hand ground on the grinder by me. And the, the mid tech stuff is the bevels are ground by somebody else on a machine. Okay. So that, you, sh you showed a picture on Instagram recently that you have one of those machines, one of those, uh, I used to. Oh, okay. Okay. So what's the benefit of having, I mean, I can, I can tell what the benefit of having, why wouldn't you have one and keep the mid tech in house? I know that sounds funny, but well, uh, a, a blade grinder costs about a quarter million dollars. Oh, that might be a barrier to entry. Yeah. It's kind of a thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the the good blade grinders like the blade grinders i had were 40 years old and they were hydraulic over electric and it was they were they were going to be a nightmare to work to, to get them made working it could be done of course but at some point the floor space they were taking up became more valuable than the machines right so we sold the machines all right so let's talk about your process so you you have first of all how do you come up with designs what's your inspiration for the designs you know aside from say the 1918 we're talking about well as far as like my original my the original designs that i design um i just like i'll sit down and just start sketching knives like if i if i sit down to and i will sit down it's not like it's, you know it comes to me in a, in a vision of mist or whatever <laughs> and i have to <laughs> capture it before it gets away and it, it, it's a it, it's a it's 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 an industrious thing that I'm doing. So I will sit there but all right, I'm going to design some knives and I'll sketch out on usually on paper, a bunch of knives, maybe 20 knives. And then I'll come back the next day and be like, well, six of those are crap. So I just won't even look at them again. And eh, maybe I could tweak these other two and maybe this one will be okay. And maybe, maybe this one's already good to go. So, and then I'll, I'll if I think that they got some, some legs and they might be able to get some work to them, I'll, I'll bring them into CAD and I'll make sure that the thing I've designed will fold and function in, in the real world of physics mm -hmm. because violations of the laws of physics are not usually approved by companies to get into production. Um, so I'll, and I'll, I'll try and I'll, I'll move from there. And usually like if I'm going to, if I'm going to go to, to Kershaw and, and present them with some designs, I will get however many de knife designs I've got together and I will engineer them to the point where I know they will open and close and probably not violate too many laws of physics. And then I'll take them that as a concept because there's no need to, you know, flush out and fully engineer a bunch of knives. They're just going to go, no, we hate that one. We hate that one. We hate that. One. No, this one's okay. We hate this right. one. We'll take this one. Cause I, I've taken as many as 25 designs to Kershaw before at a time, or sometimes I'll take two or three or six or, and you know they'll take what they take, right? Um, so it's and also like designing knives for Kershaw is a lot different than designing my custom knives because when I design a custom knife, I'm designing a knife for knife geeks, for us kind of people, for right. knife aficionados, right? And design a thirty dollar Kershaw is is not necessarily the same crowd. Okay, so I was going to ask you this: Is this is so? Okay, I, I want to present some designs to Kershaw, uh, and it's going to have to sell to non knife geeks. Um, do you think I got to make this as flashy or as what? I mean, as wild or like what? I, I don't know. There's no magic formula, or else we'd be doing that all the time. Mm -hmm. It just kind of it just kind of depends. I I try to. I was. <laughs> I won't say who it was, but I was talking with another one of the Kershaw designers and he's like, oh, I got to go home and design Kershaw six more knives that I hate. <laughs> I love it. But the Kershaw I'm people like, love them, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, but it's so like, like you'll, you, it's important for, for people who are watching this to understand that when you look at a Kershaw release or a CRKT, you know, a, a real mass market company like that, if you don't like their knife, the design, it's not for you. They probably are okay with that because they didn't actually design it for you. They didn't design it for the knife geeks. It's for the guys who are going to walk through the, the aisles of Walmart and go, I could use a new knife. That one's freaking cool. I'll use that one. Yeah. So people will make the mistake of thinking that every product is for them. Oh, I, you know, they'll get on Facebook and, oh, I hate this knife or, and it'll be like Kershaw's biggest seller. Right. Or, you know, I mean, like the Bear Grylls knives 
have sold millions of knives. Oh, yeah. Not so much to knife geeks, but to people who, who have money and will buy knives, which is what people what those business are in what the business are doing i mean right and they happen to be in target and right you know okay you go look at whatever you're gonna look at i'm gonna go look at the sports stuff oh there's a bear grills knife i'll buy it that dude's uh, awesome he drinks his own piss <laughs> that means i'll be able to survive with this knife yeah not uh, that you know uh to me i think okay so well before we get there let me just ask you you were saying when you design your custom knives, you're in a different mind. You're thinking about people like me. You're thinking about the people like the audience of this show. Um, so do you look at trends? What are people liking? I mean, you don't seem like that, but I mean, uh, how, how, do, how is the approach different for knife geeks? At a, at a certain point, I'm, I look at the trends as in are bigger knives or smaller knives, mm. you know, moving around a lot more right now or, you know, stuff like that. But as far as like the actual design itself, there's an ask for every seat. And in custom knives, the output is so limited. You can sell a lot of, you can sell about, you can find someone that's going to love that knife. And it just depends on now it's easier to sell. And so another thing, a lot of knife makers will be very popular in their, in the knife geek community. Mm -hmm. And then they'll go to a mass market situation like Kershaw or CRKT or whatnot. And their knife won't do very well because it's not, they're not used to designing that to that market, or they get a false sense of security because they can make, you know, 30 knives in a year and sell them for $4,000 each. That that 30 knives transmits into 3,000 or 30,000 knives. Oh, right. There's a and scaling problem when you go production. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the people who, because just because there's 30 guys. <clears throat> who will spend an exorbitant amount of money on a knife doesn't mean that there's 30,000 guys that'll send it. They'll spend a small amount of money on a knife right. as, as design. Right. That's, I mean, to me, uh, we're talking about Kershaw. So uh, to me, uh, it's like the Gus Cicchini, uh, Cicchini, um, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, the Brazilian designer who did the zero zero five five mm -hmm. with that. You know what I mean? He, he does some really unique, designs right yeah and very much. They, they make sense for that custom market because mm -hmm. they're an acquired taste it's not like anyone who needs a knife is going to see that and even think knife let alone reach for it and use it over something that looks more like a knife and then they made so they made that zt and it did fairly well and it was around for a few years but they also made two very small uh kershaws also designed by him also very you know, inaccessible or oblique designs for the average right. eye. And uh, I don't think they did as well uh, because they're being marketed to a different crowd. Like you said, uh, I, I could be speaking out of school, but I think that's a perfect example of what you're talking about. I don't know how, uh, how those designs did at all. I didn't pay attention to it at all. Gus does great work. And part of the thing is uh, an okay, an okay custom design will sell if it's done really really well mm -hmm. gus's knives are very avant-garde they're very they're, they're very distinctive and they're yeah. very i mean they're 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 studies in design they're very they're very awesome but they're i don't know if they have a mass appeal i don't know right it's like a certain kind of fine art certain kind of paintings you know it might it might take a little development uh like you were talking about connoisseurship um to get there when you so we're talking about now your designs not for not for the, these collaborations but for your shop how do you determine now okay this is this is a model that i'm going to sink my custom knife making energy into and then this is a model that i'm going to mid-tech is that is that a is that a process a, de a decision making process you got to go through it is like so when i design a, a knife and i'm gonna make it into a custom like all I'll have that design printed on a piece of paper and I'm like, that's awesome. I'm going to make that knife. Like, yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty much the, the, the process. So like, <laughs> I, like I don't, good. I don't make, I don't make everything that I design. Like I've never made a Weston. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I've never made uh, a couple of those Kershaw knives. I've never made an Aster, the new, oh. uh, uh, Spartan, Spartan blades. Blade. Not, I've never, you know, but like, so the, the Kershaw XCOM, 
I didn't intend to make that knife. And then they sent me a bunch of pre-production samples and I run them through my pocket until they get dull just to kind of get a feel for the knife as a, as a tool. And I was, I was out there in the yard and I was cutting something and I laid it down and I, I would do, I was working on something else and I looked at it and I saw that knife just laying there and I'm like, I'm going to have to make that knife right freaking now. So, I think I went inside and started working on it right then. I'm like, yeah, now, now I really like making that knife, but I had not intended to add that as a custom. That's the one that looks like a bayonet, right? It's, it's, uh, inspired by the M whatever M3. the brand the, M3. The M3 bayonet. And it wasn't a bayonet. The M3 is not a bayonet. It's just a trench knife. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've I've seen that you've made a lot of sort of fancy custom versions of that. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a cool. I do not have that one. I was thinking before that would make a fantastic ZT. People are always talking about how ZT lost its compass. You know, uh, you you made the nine hundred and the or the the nine hundred and the nine twenty, and I had the nine twenty for a while. Uh, that was a cool knife based on your Harpy model. Mm -hmm. um, but people keep saying, okay, at this point they. The last couple of years, they've been faltering with some kind of weak designs. Or, um, and and I love ZT. I'm a, I'm a huge fan. So uh, uh, I say they should make a version of that knife, the XCOM. That would La be rad. Last time I was up there, I pitched that actually pretty hard. I, I, I really wanted them to do that as a frame lock with ZT. I don't know that they're they're going to do it, but I really I pitched it pretty hard when I was there. They probably got annoyed with me for pitching it hard as I did. <laughs> All right, so a, a uh, typical work day for you in your shop. You have a CNC, right? Mm -hmm. you, you you do everything on so mills, mills, and 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 automation. Where do you draw the line? I know, um, I know a lot of people uh, in you know knife makers. They have interesting ideas or maybe it's custom knife fans have interesting ideas about what a custom is and if you're not if you're not hafting it with a with a you know a hand tool it's it's not customer it's not handmade um where do you fall on that kind of thing my in the end i don't care i don't care what someone thinks the knife should be or what uh, any maker thinks that their definition should be they're more than welcome to have that view, whatever it is, as long as they're honest with their customers about it. Because the, the customer basis has proven time and time again that they don't care. They don't care if you use a CNC, if you use lasers or ninjas or, or a burnt fish hook and half a broken brick. They don't care. But nobody, they just want cool stuff. But nobody wants to be lied to. So don't say that you're scratching it out with a file and then be using a CNC. As long as you're honest with your customers about what things are, it's okay. If you, th if you don't think that I make custom knives because I have a CNC and I have a drill press and I don't use my forge anymore, that's fine. But I will never lead you astray on what I'm doing. If, if this is how I work, if, that's, if you don't think that that makes it okay, free market will say you don't need to buy it. And that's fine. And I don't, I don't bear anyone any ill will who thinks that. A lot of guys will be against CNC because they don't have CNCs. Mm. So if you if you lock them into in a room with a CNC and all right, here's the here's the the file here's the CAD file to make the key to get out of the room, they'd be they die in there. <laughs> I mean, I I can make knives at any level of of technology. I've I've demonstrated I've made knives with no power tools and with all the power tools. Right, right. So it's. I'm not dependent on CNC and I don't think a knife maker should be dependent on CNCs. I'm not, I use grind and fixtures sometimes, but I'm not dependent on grind and fixtures. I don't have to use them. Right. So it's that, that is what I think makes it the, the range of a proper professional knife maker is they're not married to one technology. If you took my CNC away, I'd be annoyed that I had to grind titanium again and set my fingers on fire, but I certainly know how to do it and I could get her done, but it's not, it's, it's just, some people have employees, but no CNC. Some people have both. Some people have just CNC, and I, I don't like having other people in my shop, so I don't have any some employees. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, some people, uh, they'll say, oh, you know, well, if uh, Rembrandt had a video camera, he'd use it. You know, why wouldn't he? He was striving his whole life to make reality in paint and canvas. Why wouldn't he 
so that's kind of how I approach it. It's like a tool is a tool is a tool. And if you have uh, the right mind to design the right tool, i.e. a knife, who cares how you make it? Uh, that's that's kind of how I feel about it. Though I must I must uh, acknowledge that, uh, like we we're talking about connoisseurship and collectors, collectors get very weird and very specific. Oh, I only want uh, you know something that's been, and then X, Y, and Z, you name it, and people go down those rabbit holes. And that's um, fine. Yeah, I, I applaud it. I applaud I'm, it. I, yeah, I bear them no ill will at all. They, even if they don't like my, they like Les George makes stupid knives because he owns a CNC. And, Hey, hey, God bless you. Go on with your bad self. So materials, like I I feel this uh, pull towards the finer steels because I am brainwashed in that direction. I, I don't know how else to put it. It's just keeping up with the Joneses or or uh, I'm not sure exactly what it is. I, I joke. I like the alphanumeric combination of M390 better than 8CR13. It's more wieldy on the tongue. So therefore, it must be a better steel and I'll pay more money for it. Right. How do you decide when you're putting together uh, a knife, a project, whether it's uh, a mid-tech or something out of your custom shop? Like, How do you decide what materials to assign to it and then how to, I hate to be gauche, but charge for it? Well, um, the, the charge for materials is based on how much the material costs. And it's a, it's pretty simple math. You know, Damascus costs more than 440C, so Damascus costs more to make out of than 440C. Not that I use 440C, because that, that went out with Disco. But, uh, <laughs> and there's, it. yeah, right. And there are some, there's a lot of psychology and marketing involved in what steel you actually use, because most people wouldn't even really be able to tell the difference between 440C and you know, M390. They would. They just wouldn't. They just, I don't know that I would. <laughs> I don't know that I would either. I mean, except on the sharpening. As, ex yeah, except for using. If I was grinding it, I could probably tell the difference. But like, as far as like using a pocket knife, because I don't use a pocket knife. You know, for an hour at a time, I'll open it, cut a box or a string or a tape or a, a limb or whatever, and then put it away. And I don't remember the last time I sharpened it, so I don't know if it lasted six months or eight months or thirty years. I just don't know. I mean. It wouldn't, it wouldn't make any difference in my life. Like, so when it, when it, when it comes to a bigger project, like a mid tech or even with a company logistics come into play, hmm. I would like to use PD one a lot more than I do, but I can't get it. Or last time I tried last couple of times I tried to get it. I couldn't get it. Like I call a steel guy and be like, no, we ain't got it. Can't have it. Sorry. Now, is that so, because it's nicer to work with? Uh, it's more of a pleasure to work with in your shop? Or you like how it performs? Or no, It's like 3V on steroids is how they – and, and, and the, the, the chemistry looks like it, and everything I've used on it has been awesome. But I can't get it, so it doesn't matter how good it is. Like a knife doesn't matter how good it is if someone doesn't buy it and do something with it. It doesn't, it just doesn't matter. Right, right. Like, so well, how – how about that beautiful Damascus uh, I've been seeing on your daggers? Is that, do you forge that? Is that your own? No. Uh, no. Okay. That's, okay. Chad, I get all my Damascus from Chad, Chad Nichols. Nichols. Okay. I uh, I know how to make Damascus. I've seen him do it. I've done it myself a long time ago. I was actually in the ABS many years ago. Oh. So I, I've done some Damascus and some forging, and that's not gentlemanly kind of work for me. I like my air conditioning into my machine shop. <laughs> All right, so we're not going to see you on Forged in Fire anytime soon. No, no, no. <laughs> I've gone over there, and I've, I've every once in a while, while I'm talking to him all, because he lives a half a mile from here. Oh, Chad, Chad Nichols? Yeah, okay. yeah. So I go over there, and he'll be forging. I'm like, let me take this heat, and I'll get on there, and I'll run through the press or something, and I'm like, man, that, whew, I'm out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, just give him your address. Send it yeah. when it's done. Yeah. <sighs> like, so I'll, I know the combination of where they keep the steel. I'll just go get what I need. I'll leave you a note what I took. So do you have uh, a cr uh, group of people who follow you, who buy, um, who buy your custom knives? I'm, I'm curious how it works with, with knife makers such as yourself. I mean, you're very popular, uh, but also you have this very exclusive, I mean, your, your custom knives are, are hard to come by and, and exclusive. Do you have people who follow you around like pilot fish behind a shark waiting for knives to drop? No, no, <laughs> the people get a false sense of fame about knife makers 
knife makers get a false sense of fame by themselves too. You have to, you have to remember that the most famous knife maker in the world, whoever you think he is, it ain't me, but whoever you think the most famous knife maker in the world is, is still at least three to four steps below the least famous pro bowler in the hierarchy <laughs> of famous people. Yeah. So the most <laughs> is below the least of them. Right. So <laughs> being a famous knife maker is not, is not a thing. That's not a real thing. That's not. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh-huh. when you're like, I'm a little starstruck and I'm like, why? What's what's that? <laughs> well, only because you designed this, you know, that a boy, that a boy. Uh, but no, no, I guess, I guess what I mean is, uh, yeah, no, 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 totally. I, I, I get that. Um, <laughs> but in terms of the knife world and the people, you know, you're the waters you're swimming in, you're, you're, you're somewhat of a big fish. And so my, my curiosity is like, can people like you, or can you just make knives and, and, and just kind of sell them as you make them. And, and they just kind of, that's okay. pretty much what I do. Cause I, I've, I've done the whole orders thing in the past and, and it, just, it becomes very tedious to have to keep up with that much information. I'm not good at it. So I'll end up losing an order or somebody will take, it'll take too long on somebody and, and they'll rightfully get pissed off because mm-hmm. I'm a, cause I'm a dumbass with all of my administrative stuff because of all the reasons that I'm a custom knife maker by trade, being really, really good at paperwork is not one of them. <laughs> so, yeah. And I bet if you have a book full of uh, orders for different knives Every single person's got like, uh, oh, but make sure that you don't make the backspacer too much. And then also I want mine double edged. Oh, and also, you know, and and to have all that, especially if you're not good with, uh, uh, you know, keep it. OK, actually, when you scroll down, I think that first knife you're talking about is is in these pictures. But if you're not good at that kind of stuff, it's not going to pan out. It's, right. It just sucks. Yeah. Look at those clowns on there. Yeah. Uh oh gosh. These are these are beautiful. These are full on custom beauties. Okay, that one on the lower right. Is that what you were talking about? The one that you made in uh that one there? No, that's an FM one. I made that in Texas. Oh, okay. That's a beaut. I love that handle. Is that uh, ivory of some sort? Yeah, that's pre ban ivory. Pre ban. What what okay so the the uh, the banning of ivory was a couple of years back and uh, has that has that affected you much or the banning of ivory happened in the eighties and they're like nothing else can come in basically from that that was elephant ivory like legit right African, okay African elephant ivory and uh, I got that I, I I got a couple pieces of it from Tom Mayo in the Hawaii in a trade. And, I think he's probably older than the elephant. So, uh, well, no, he definitely was. He's definitely he's super old. Um, but so I got it from him. That's why it was it was legal. Now they the the recent push they tried to include mammoth ivory in the mix because we have to protect the mammoths from extinction. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say which which is a either a really sneaky move or a really really ill informed move. It's. I think the basis of it was they didn't want to try to figure out whether it was elephant or mammoth ivory. Oh, and, but that's a, that's a dumb thing. Cause anybody who's educated and it can tell at a glance from the grain structure, if it's which one it is. I mean, it's not, it's not rocket surgery to figure out which one it is. They were just trying to make it the least common denominator of stupidity. Right. Right. And it was, it was just knee jerks of politicians making rules. They didn't really understand is what it come down to. How has your business been affected by uh, uh, this past year's pandemic and how do you expect it to uh, be affected in the future? I mean, is this a it, weird times? Definitely weird times. There have been a lot of challenges in working right now because if you deal with any kind of outside vendors, either in mid-tech or in the, in the production factories, there everyone's experiencing uh slowdowns because of Mm -hmm. because of people will get sick and be quarantined so i was talking to a company that i worked with the other day i won't name them because i don't know if it's okay to do that but it's they're like 20 percent of their workforce was out wow so they're they're operating it at 80 percent just because they're and they they still have to pay those people who are out 
so they're they're not a big business, so they're like we gotta we gotta keep our money on the ball here, watch the watch our our stuff to keep keep afloat. Um, but on the upside, sales have been really good, really strong for everybody across the industry that I know of right now. Hmm. Um, we've been very fortunate. A lot of people, people who buy custom knives are have have some money to burn usually at least at least a little bit. Mm-hmm. So this has a lot of them haven't been super affected, doesn't seem like. Um, and people aren't going on vacations; they're not going out to eat as much. They're sitting around looking at stuff on the internet, and they're. I'm sure Amazon's business is way up. I'm sure yeah. all these people's, you know, people who are selling stuff online, the business is way up. Um, the the industry is doing very well right now, sales wise. Some of our production things are, the logistics of production have been challenging. Right. But and a lot of and with the gun industry going gangbusters like it has since like a lot of the heat treaters also heat treat parts for guns. Another company I was talking to oh. in passing are like our heat treat turnaround went from two weeks to 12 weeks. Whoa. Because the, our heat treater is doing gun parts and they are just out the door with gun parts. So from two weeks to 12 weeks of just parts in the wind somewhere. So that's that's just one example of one of the challenges that we're the industry is dealing with. And just and really, all production is dealing with, not just ours. Right, right. And 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 then you start talk about crossing international borders and all that and makes it even worse. And that that actually stands to reason. I, I was initially surprised that you said that sales are up and doing great across the knife market. But yeah, it makes sense. I've I've bought quite a few uh 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 you know pandemic knives or whatever you want to call them a little impulse like hmm what would bring my mood up in this moment oh right. i know <laughs> oh, a knife a knife i think i'll find something to cut it with and uh if not i'll just put it next to all the other ones uh but you know you do make a luxury item when it comes to um you know your 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 most of your work which is higher end but well, nobody needs what i make it's the bottom line well that's not completely true that's not that's I don't think that's true at all. Uh, and I'll tell you why. First of all, you do a number of knives that are uh, way within reach of most people through Kershaw and people need knives and they you probably sell a lot of those knives. And yeah. so you get them in the head. So people need those. But I also would argue that the, people do need that luxury item if they can afford it. It does buoy their spirits. And, uh, you know, in these troubling times. We need to buoy our spirits, so I, I think I think people do need what you what you have to sell, uh, and what you make, and I think a lot of it has to do with uh, your design eye. I mean, like your designs are almost straight across the board recognizable. Sometimes, uh, like in that in the in your super super high end custom stuff, some of the designs are oh that makes sense that it's his, but I wouldn't necessarily pick it out of a line out a uh, lineup. But the the thumb ramp. Oh, the I think the uh, this camera is on. Uh, the thumb ramp is such a thing for you. That extended uh, bit of purchase there. That beautiful neutral handle. I mean, this there are echoes of this design in the uh, the Aster, the new Spartan blades. You know, and there are echoes of this design uh, across a lot of your your knives. Even that big uh, that big giant ZT, the first one that came out. Uh, I can't remember what it was. It was one of the 900s. The first one was a little one. Okay. Oh, okay. The one after that one. The big the big G10 work knife. It was like Yeah. Yeah. Even that one. Uh so I I think your your design I your aesthetic and then of course you build these things and they and you know what you're doing. So Sometimes. what what, <laughs> what do what do we have to look forward to from you? Um we have ProTech is ramping up their capacity, so I've been working with them on a couple of new things at ProTech. Not what you'd expect oh, us to make, sweet. but uh, I'm not going to let any more out of the bag on that. But it's not what you'd expect. But I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited about them both. There's about two products we're working on right now, one one more than the other, but they're both going to be pretty awesome. So you say not what you would expect to make, and I'm not going to ask for specifics. But do you mean it's a model of yours we wouldn't expect to see? Or you're going in with them and making toothbrushes or something just totally different. It's not toothbrushes. Okay. And it, it's not. It's not. It's you, you, the model won't surprise you. Okay. But yeah, there's no toothbrushes. 
Okay. So wait, what uh, what inspired the SBR? Because I know SB the SBR is just a shortened version of the Rock Eye. The Rock Eye. So the Rock Eye is a custom knife model is how it started. Okay. And then because the Rock Eye is an ordinance item. So in 2005, I went to the People's Republic of Laos on a JPAC mission, which is the Joint Task Force Full Accounting, based on Hawaii, where they recovered the, the remains of POWs and MIAs oh, wow. from all wars. They're, they're still prosecuting sites from World War I. And so we went to, a, went to Laos, to, and uh, I worked a, I think it was a crashed A6. I think, it was, I think that's what it was. It was an A6. But the, the bird had gone in, basically a controlled flight into terrain, but it was fully loaded with ordnance. Oh. So all these all these recovery teams have EOD techs on them, and their job is to move, to identify and remove the, whatever explosive hazards can be moved or to, to bypass what can't be for and someone else to come behind you and dispose of it. So on my site, because it went in fully loaded, there were four 500-pound bombs laying there, and then the... Uh, an, an ordnance dispenser of rock eyes was on board. And what that is, is it, it's think of it like a thin metal bomb, like a hot water heater that's full of little tiny bombs. So I think there's 247 rock eyes in the Mark 118 dispenser, if I remember right. And what it does is it drops off the wing of the aircraft and it basically it pops open and it dispenses these little yard lawn dart looking pieces of ordnance and they are shape charges and they, they they're supposed to hit tanks and blow t blow holes in tanks or hit troops in the open, and so it's two, so there's 247 of them scattered around. I think I probably moved 250 of them or 257 Whoa. of them. It was they were everywhere. So I'm as I'm moving all these pieces of trash, basically, I'm like, I'm gonna name a knife for Rock Eye. You watch. <laughs> so I name it knife the Rock Eye, and VSEP is a kind of a Rock Eye. It, it's where they take. They took a rock eye, they ran it through the value engineer change proposal system, and they basically they they stripped out some of the electronics and they made it uh more mechanical and they're thereby more reliable, streamlined all the production of it to make it cheaper, and they sold it, and then America sells it to foreign countries. But uh so the VSEP rock eye is the basically the mid-tech version of the real rock eye. Right. In ordinance. So I took the rock eye design from my first mid-tech. And I stripped away all the, the fanciness of it to, to, to what I could have considered the barest of essentials. And that first design is what you're holding in your hand. That's the, just the first version of that. So I, I stripped away like all, you know, all the bolsters and all the, all the fancy materials and just tried to make it as straightforward as possible. Everything you needed, but nothing that I didn't so that I can make that first mid tech project. And that's why I call it the VSEP is what's a VSEP rock eye. And that VSEP rock eye is the same dimensionally as the pro tech rock eye. Yeah. So, so that was my first production project. Actually, I, at, at, uh, at, at shot show one year, I knew that the guy that owned pro tech was named Dave. So I'm like, I think this knife would be awesome as a automatic. So I did the CAD for it. Already, so what I thought was the cat word, it sucked originally. I actually, <laughs> I, I did, I put a button on it and I took it. I went to the shot show and I, I went to the booth and I'm like, Hey, uh, can I talk to Dave? Yeah, hang on. And then Dave walks over. Dave is like one of the nicest guys in the entire business. Dave is awesome. Yeah. And he's like, Hey, how you doing? And I'm like, I introduced myself. Hey, I'm Les George. I'm a knife maker and I have a knife that I think would be awesome as an automatic. You should make it. He goes, Okay. I go, You want to see it? And he goes, I, go, I already did the cad. You want to see it? He goes, yeah, let's see it. I show, I pulled, I pulled it out and I had one of the frame locks. I hit this is the frame lock version. Here's the CAD picture for the automatic. I think we should, I, 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 what do you think? He looked at it and goes, yeah, cool. And I go, he goes, yeah, sure. And I'm like, so, so you want to do it? He's like, yeah, sure. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Let's do this thing. I go, I go, I'll email you guys the CAD files when I get back. Let's, you know, let's, we're, in, we're in business. He's like, yeah, we'll do this. I'm like, okay. Wow. Well, that was easy. That was easy. <laughs> that was easy and pleasant. Right? And Dave continues to be awesome all these years later. 
So, I mean, presumably he had heard of you. I mean, you don't, oh. he, I don't think you just walk up with a file and say, Hey, I want to make this. And he's like, okay, he must've known that you were the bomb. I mean, well, he, he saw your project and he's like, yeah, this will do. I never, I never asked him that. I never thought about, I don't, I don't shake the, I don't shake the tree like that. Yeah. 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 Why, why bother? Why yeah, everything's right. Everything's that? working fine. That's, that's not. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. I would never, so, I would never have assumed that he knew me when I walked up there. I mean, of course, of course I am the great and wonderful Les George. You've heard of me. Of course. Uh, that I love. Pro how bowlers. Pro yeah. Right. Right. You may have seen me on the pro bowl tour, you know, several yeah, I'm years not back. that famous. The, Rock Eye, or the uh, the Rock Eye Auto came out. They made it in so many different iterations. I thought that was great. I mean, what a great platform! Or, or, or yeah, I guess platform is the right term. This is a great design to tweak. I mean, they just came. They had all these different handles, uh, handle materials, handle treatments, and uh, and psh, they just kept coming out with them. Obvi obviously, a very very famous model because they decided to truncate it and make it tiny or smaller i, I haven't uh, experienced the sbr yet but so the the sbr i was sitting in their shop one day and he's like so what do you want to do next and i'm like you know what would be awesome a giant rock eye like five inch blade and he's like yes let's do that and then a while later i, I ran into him somewhere else and he, i kind of i kind of got the impression he's like where the freak is that cad file there dumbass <laughs> and uh, he would never talk to me like that of course right. it'd be funny if he did and uh, i'm like you know what dave i don't think we should do a, a big one and he's like no i'm like i think we should do a small one and he's like okay i'm like well then i'll send you the files i already did it I already got drawn up as a matter of fact well i mean that's a perfect example of before i said do you follow the trends and design to them and no not really except that size you know every that's but i mean that's that's yeah it, in no way a compromise of design it's just a change of size and shape and um you know uh that's what people want that's what people want to carry that was a great idea even though i would love to have a five inch rock eye because i love big knives that would be totally rad but i mean i think it was a more savvy move to make the the small the sbr and, and it's gone, uh, and that that knife has gone over very well. There have been, oh, they've yeah. been very, I've been very pleased with how it's done, and they have been too. It seems like every knife reviewer is, uh, you know, in love with that knife on on YouTube. Uh, I, I want to find out from you uh, after this many, many, many years of experience that you have. I'm just, kidding. <laughs> just kidding. You're you're a babe in the woods. I know, but uh, after <laughs> all of this experience, like, what what can you offer to people? who might be in your shoes, but several years back and are coming up, what kind of advice do you have to, to new knife makers? Uh, to brand new knife makers, learn how to make knives before you try to reinvent the wheel of knife design and change the game. Um, learn how to learn the fundamentals because they're the advanced stuff is just fast fundamentals or, or well done fundamentals. The fundamentals are where you make all your money, always, every time. Um, and then for equipping your shop, buy the tool that you need the first time. Don't buy the one that'll get by, because you'll spend. You'll buy that one, and then two years later, you got to buy the big one. So buy the right one the first time and save yourself a lot of trouble. No one's gonna listen to that, and that's okay. <laughs> well, that's a tough one because when you start out at something and you're relatively new at something. Uh, well, I, I've made the mistake in the past. I don't do this anymore where I'll just like, oh, yeah, I'm, I, I think I'm really interested in this. Sink all this money into it. And then that uh, grinder becomes, you know, the world's most expensive sh shirt hanger or whatever it is, you know. Uh, there's there, there's a I'm talking about someone who's committed to it and knows that they're into it. If right. you're if you're just going to get your toes wet and get something inexpensive, you know, a, a grinder is something you can do that on, I guess, but for a while. But. Once you decide to buy a proper professional grinder, get the variable speed, get get all the bells and whistles you can put on it. You know, don't don't go from the the two by forty two Grizzly grinder and then get a single speed KMG. Right. Get the variable speed, get get it set up right so you can do proper work if you're going to do it. Not that and you it, can't do great work on a on on the Grizzly grinder because the tool isn't in charge. You are right. But if you're going to do it, make yourself save yourself a lot of trouble. 
And then uh, a, a part B to that question, knife makers who are, you know, fully invested in the game and now are thinking about taking the dive into a more automated uh, process like CNC and, and CAD. Any, any uh, advice to, to those people? When you buy a machine, get a machine that has ball screws, will do rigid tapping, has a chip auger, that's not as important. It has a tool changer. That's also super important. Chip auger is the lowest important. But you got to be able to do rigid tapping, have ball screws, ball screws, and uh, what was that one? Uh, that other one, I forget. Um, <laughs> they, can, they can rewind. Right, right, right. But yeah, so you don't want a converted manual mill with, without ball screws. I mean, you could do that, but that's an example of you're going to end up buying the right one later anyway after you beat yourself to death with that old one for a while. Don't do that to yourself. Just get a proper machine. All right. Well, Les George, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast, sir. It's been a pleasure talking to you again and uh, seeing a little corner of your shop and seeing some of your beautiful knives. Before we let you go, hold up hold up that titanium cast uh, knuckle duster knife. Look at this, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Look at that thing. Uh, beautiful, beautiful. I, I love that you do all the work that you do in terms of the knives you design and make, but I also love that you're keeping some of this past alive by investing yourself in making them and figuring out the best way to do it in a modern sense. I really love doing those retro projects where we take like, like this Spartan one is a good, was the first example of one I really did was we were going to do a more traditional kind of knife. And then I forget who it was. I think it was Hill came out with another version of their knife. And Curtis texted me and is like, do you even want to do this anymore? Because like, Hill's got their knife out now. And I go, yeah, let's do it, but let's unscrew the thing. Let's do it. Let's do it for real. Let's... So that's why I read everything I could find on those that, on that dagger design from back in the day. And I tried to take their design intent from you know, 1940, 42, whatever it was, and apply the last 70 years of design, mm -hmm. material, manufacturing technology, and not being under the pressure of a world war we don't know if we're going to win yet. Right. And try to take their intent, but do it today. And that's what I came up with for my first shot at it. And that's what I try to do on these other projects when I go back and use the old school designs is try to use, do what they were trying to do, but if they were doing it today and not with the limitations that they had from back in the day. Right. Recreating, but making it modern and making it, making it new again. Well, Les George, love your knives. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you guys. It's been great. Thank you. I appreciate you thinking of me to put on the show. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Take care. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. Well, uh, pleasure to talk with Les George and to, and to see some of those extra, extra sweet knives up close. Those daggers, those knuckle duster knives, those 1918 knives are are. Man, I, I got to get a collection of those sometime, somewhere down the road. Uh, but before that happens, thank, thank Les for making these really, really gorgeous knives. I love them. This is uh, uh, this VSEP is one of those knives that that could get you to stop collecting knives. If you were looking for that one perfect knife, I mean, for me, I always liked that better than the Sabenza, and uh, well. It was a pleasure to have him on the show. Learn the fundamentals. That's his main lesson. Learn the fundamentals because all the advanced stuff, that's fast fundamentals. It's like uh, uh, slow is smooth, smooth is fast kind of thing. And uh, well, it's great to hear from a master uh, who's still alive and still knocking the stuff out. So Les George, thanks for coming on the show. And uh, thank you for listening to the show and watching. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And uh, I will see you next time right here on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob 
Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. 